particularly, uh, for example, in imagining a scene, requires it to be put into egocentric coordinates. And if we go on to um, look at uh, electrophysiological recordings in, in animals, we now know quite a lot about the neural representations that support this kind of spatial cognition. So, for example, in freely moving rodents, um, we know now for, for a long time that there are neurons in and around the hippocampal formation that encode uh, our location and uh, orientation relative to the environment, such as place cells and grid cells, which are tuned to our environmental location, uh, usually irrespective of which direction we're facing. And then there are head direction cells, which are tuned to uh, the direction that we're facing, irrespective of where we are. Uh, these are all allocentric representations shown on the left here. Uh, and there are also lots of different kinds of egocentric representations uh, in sensory systems and motor systems uh, tuned to respond to the egocentric location of a stimulus, for example, in the visual system, or uh, tuned to egocentric movements such as these trajectory cells in the uh, parietal corte cortex or striatum that fire whenever the animal is making a left turn uh, as part of a trajectory. So just to make sure that you um, uh, understand what kind of data we're talking about, uh, here's a, a video of a, well, a, a cartoon of a, of a rat exploring in a circular box. And each little red dot is uh, when one place cell fires an action potential. And what you can see is that whenever the rat goes over to the left-hand side of the box, uh, that cell fires uh, an action potential. And it doesn't really matter which way the animal is facing or moving just whenever it's in that part of its environment, that place cell signals that it thinks that the rat is in that place to the rest of the brain. So um, we could try to understand uh, what are the uh, environmental inputs that um, tell a place cell where, when the animal is in the right place in the environment. And we know something about this now after many uh, decades of research. So, for example, uh, with Tom Hartley and John O'Keefe, um, we showed that the firing of a place cell recorded in different shaped boxes, and you can see in the blue square in the middle of the slide, you can see a firing rate map for the same cell recorded in a, two different square boxes, a diamond-shaped box and a circular box. That pattern of firing fields is consistent with the place cell getting inputs from things that are detecting the boundaries of the box. And we called these uh, predicted cells boundary vector cells. And illustrated on the left is one uh, that responds whenever there's a boundary a short distance in the allocentric direction to the east of the animal, whichever way it's facing, that cell will fire at a high rate if there's a barrier like a wall uh, at a certain distance away to the east. So the place cell whose firing fields are shown uh, in the middle of the slide there, uh, that, that pattern is consistent with it getting inputs from a boundary vector cell tuned to the east and a boundary vector cell tuned to the north, and their firing fields are shown above it. And if they were added together as inputs to this place cell, they would make it fire in the northeast corner of these different boxes. And so that might be um, one way of describing the environmental inputs that's, that's driving that place cell. And many years later, Colin Lever, uh, who's also shown on the left there, uh, found these, uh, these cells existed in the subiculum of the hippocampal formation. There's a nice example shown on the right here, showing that this cell fires whenever, as the animal explores around its box, there's a wall maybe 15 or 20 centimeters away to the south of it. And that's also true if a, a row of wine bottles are put into the box it fires whenever that barrier is 20 centimeters to the south of it, showing the second firing field on the right there. Now, since then, much more recently, the uh, Mosers have shown uh, things called object vector cells uh, in enterinal cortex and similar sort of border cells, similar to boundary vector cells, in, uh, also in enterinal cortex. These object vector cells, they fire whenever there's an object, a small object like the one shown at the bottom there, uh, a certain uh, allocentric distance and direction away from the animal um, to the east in the first example on the left and uh, to the south, um, southeast in the middle one or um, northwest to the, the third example shown there. Okay, so if we um, 
Sorry. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> that's think a lag, need... yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> now so I'm there... beginning to understand what you yes. say. Carry on. Okay. <laughs> So the nice example of the boundary vector cell shown on the right is that has now appeared. And there it is. Uh, it fires whenever the rat is, um, has a barrier 20 centimetres or so to its south. And that's true when we put in uh, a Colin Lever and um, yeah. Steve Poulter, in fact, put in a row of wine bottles to make a second barrier. It shows a second firing field. And more recently, uh, object vector cells that I described, they're cells that respond to the allocentric vector away from uh, small objects like the one shown there. Okay, I think I've got the hang of this now. That's it. Thank you. So if we wanted to uh, make a model of uh, spatial memory and imagery, we would need to be able to translate between these egocentric uh, sensory inputs and outputs like imagery and actions, which are also egocentric, and these allocentric representations in the hippocampal formation that I've just been talking about. And to do this, we need to make use of our head direction. So for example, if there's a stimulus like the one shown by the X uh, to your right, if you're facing north, then that means the stimulus will be to your east, as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, the egocentric um, representation on the left-hand side and the head direction uh, in the middle. If we want to do this translation, we can do it via what are called gain field neurons, that is neurons that respond to both the stimulus direction and the head direction, and they're shown in the middle of the slide. So for example, the neuron shown in the, in the middle in red connects the right-centered egocentric cell to the east-tuned allocentric cell if the animal's facing north. But if it turns, say it's facing east, then a different uh, gain field neuron will um, be now mapping the ahead egocentric neuron to the uh, east allocentric neuron because the object is still to the east. And the thing is true uh, in vice versa. If I know what's to the east of me and I know which way I'm heading, then I know whether it's on my left or right. So this kind of gain field uh, circuit can be used to translate between uh, egocentric and allocentric representations. So what we could do, and I'm not going to uh, go into the details uh, <clears throat> here, but with Sue Becker and Andrei Bikansky, we tried to put together all of these different kinds of, of uh, neural representations to make a model of what spatial memory would look like. And what you can see is that um, on the left, there's uh, perception, which would be egocentric coming through the parietal lobe, and that would need to be uh, translated, probably via retrospenial cortex, making use of head direction to form the allocentric representations in the medial temporal lobe. These allocentric representations uh, can be stored in a stable over the long term and later retrieved to form Im egocentric imagery or action by going through the same translation circuit in the reverse direction. So we have a sort of bottom up and top down processing going from perception to memory and back from memory to imagery or action. And we could simulate all of the different uh, kinds of uh, cells that are required, uh, including uh, boundary vector cells and object vector cells and place cells and head direction cells, and indeed the egocentric versions of object vector cells and boundary vector cells and the gain field head direction modulated uh, versions of these uh, cells that have to do the translation. And since this model was proposed in 2001, nearly all of the predicted egocentric and allocentric and uh, gain field versions of these cells uh, have been found. So uh, although we came at this from sort of functional constraints imposed by space, they, it did have predictive power in terms of what you can record uh, electrophysiologically. This kind of model, um, is uh, also useful to try to interpret uh, what, what the functions are underlying things like metabolic uh, activity changes that you see in brain, images exper brain imaging experiments, as for example, shown on the right here, where people are remembering the location of an event. You can see that there's a metabolic activity in various parts of the brain, and they correspond pretty well to the parts of the brain, uh, in the rodent at least, uh, where these different cell types that I've been telling you about have been found. And so we can try and interpret 
what the uh, metabolic activity corresponds to in terms of uh, neural uh, firing. So uh, one thing I just want to stress, particularly uh, given Sarah Lynn Van's uh, talk coming up, is that this whole system is a circuit uh, known as PAPE circuit. And uh, an important part of it is the ascending inputs from uh, the mammillary bodies and septal nuclei uh, through the anterior thalamus and the connection via the fornix to the medial temporal lobe. So for example, the mammillary bodies uh, through to the anterior thalamus and into the medial temporal lobe is the route that brings the head direction information that is required for doing this uh, egocentric, allocentric translation. Uh, so that brings me on to uh, the second aspect uh, that I wanted to talk about quickly, which is that um, estimating location naturally has to combine uh, self-motion and environmental information. So I've talked about environmental information, but we also know where we are to some extent by knowing how we've moved recently. And both of these are important kinds of input. So um, Grid cells, which I mentioned at the start, they have this uh, firing pattern. A single cell fires whenever the animal goes into a series of locations arranged across the environment in a, in a uh, triangular grid. And uh, neighboring grid cells uh, have um, firing patterns that are spatially offset relative to each other. So you can see illustrated on the right. And this uh, gives rise to the idea that the um, Activity may pass from one grid cell to the next, driven by self-motion information, so that if I'm moving north, then the activity will pass from the red cell to the green cell. And so uh, we might have the um, hypothesis that uh, where the uh, place cells uh, maybe convey a more environmental information, grid cells maybe uh, convey uh, self-motion information, and the two need to interact to represent uh, where we are. Now, it's rather hard to uh, test that hypothesis because normally as we move around, our self-motion causes the changes in the environmental input and it's hard to dissociate the two. Uh, so with um, uh, Guifen Chen, John King, Yi Lu and Francesca Cacucci, we designed a, a virtual reality system uh, for mice uh, where the mouse running on the white ball in the middle there drives the movement of the visual world that's projected onto the floor and the screens around it. The task of the mouse here is to approach uh, stripy poles to get a, a drop of milk. And every fourth pole is always in the same location, but slowly disappears. And it's now disappeared and the, the mouse has to remember uh, where that location was to get its drop of milk. So hopefully we'll see a video now you can see the mouse uh, approaching the little stripy poles and the circle with the cross on indicates the location of the disappeared pole. So while the, um, the mouse is doing this task, it's covering the environment. We can record from play cells and grid cells and head direction cells. Uh, and also we can see that the mouse does indeed know uh, where the remembered location in the uh, environment is. So it knows that it, it's well oriented within this virtual space. So, for example, we can um, record uh, uh, play cells while the uh, animal is either in the real world, shown uh, three play cells there um, on the top row, or um, we could record the same cells in the virtual environment. And because it's in the virtual environment, we could decouple the movement of the ball from the movement of the visual world. And for example, we could increase the gain by a factor two so that when the mouse runs on the ball, the visual world moves twice as fast as it's actually moving on the ball. If we do that kind of thing, we can plot the play cell uh, firing fields either in visual coordinates or in motor coordinates. And we could even stretch between those two extremes to get the uh, representation that best matches the cell firing in the baseline virtual reality. And that would give us an indication of the relative influence of the visual inputs or the self-motion inputs onto the firing of that cell. So we could do that with a gain increase, or we could do it with a gain uh, decrease. And in both cases, uh, over uh, 
all of the play cells, they tend to be more influenced by the visual, uh, by the visual inputs than the self-motion inputs, although there's some variability across cells. We could do the same thing uh, with grid cells now. Uh, and here you see in the real world and the virtual uh, environments, uh, three different grid cell firing. And if we uh, make the same game manipulation and do the same thing to try to estimate the relative influence of the visual coordinates or the motor coordinates on the firing pattern, uh, either with gain increase or gain decrease trials, then we see uh, the, the other pattern really, that they tend to be, although there's a variation across uh, cells and indeed a slight difference between gain increase and gain decrease, uh, they tend to be more influenced by self-motion than by vision. So even simultaneously recorded cells in this, uh, the grid cells tend to be more influenced by the self-motion and the play cells more influenced by the vision. So what that tells us is that uh, indeed uh, it's probably the case that uh, play cells and grid cells are conveying somewhat different kinds of information, environmental information and self-motion information respectively. But it also makes sense that they uh, interact with each other because grid cells integrating self-motion need environmental input to uh, avoid accumulating error. And play cells that are responding to environmental inputs uh, can be updated by self-motion if those inputs are unavailable or require a lot of resources. Okay, so again, uh, uh, again thinking about Sarah Lynn's talk, um, we do need to bear in mind this system and the ascending inputs. And here, for example, in the septal nuclei, the speed cells that um, Stefan Remy's group um, recorded, they uh, correspond to the self-motion input, most likely, into the uh, uh, hippocampal formation, again, via this uh, circuit. So the final thing that I want to talk about oops, is um, the idea that we can represent our location in different ways. And it might be possible that uh, some ways of representing our location can capture the structure of space in a way that makes uh, it easy to predict where we can go. And this hopefully is an idea that uh, can generalize even to non-spatial situations. And what I mean by that um, is slightly technical and following work from Kim Staschenfeld and Tim Behrens and others, which I think perhaps uh, Tim will come back to in this session. We can think about locations on a track as a set of states, X, I, in the, in the top there. And if it's equally likely for the mouse to move left or right along the track, we could express that as a transition matrix like the one shown in black. Transition matrix T which just uh, shows that uh, from each state, the mouse will either move to the left or the right. So if P of X is our probability distribution of where we are on the track, then you can see the top plot there shows that we're pretty sure that we're in state four, that bar there for P of X. And if we want to predict where we're likely to be at time T plus one, the next time step, we multiply that vector by our transition matrix T. And that tells us that the next time step, as shown in the next bar chart down, we're likely to be at states three or five because we will have either moved left or right. And again, if we want to know where we'll be at time T plus two, we multiply by the transition matrix again and again, and we can sort of predict where we'll, we'll be most likely on the track. Now we could try and do that kind of, um, that kind of maths that comes from decision-making theory, uh, we could try and do it with neural populations. So for example, we could have a population of place cells which represents uh, P of X. And each place cell is tuned to uh, respond in a different location. If we make the weighted sum of their firing profiles weighted by their uh, firing rates, then that would estimate our probability of where we are for us in this population representation. And as, the, uh, as we move around, the firing rates of the play cells will change and that will cause the, the uh, probability of where we are to track uh, where we are um, driven <clears throat> by our movements. But if we want to predict uh, where we'll be at the next time step at uh, T plus one, so here's uh, the 
how we would estimate our probability uh, currently, the weighted sum of uh, firing profiles multiplied by firing rates. If we want to predict where we were at the next time step, then we would multiply by the transition matrix, but it's not clear how we do that with neurons. We've got to multiply this matrix into the population vector. We don't really know how to do that. So instead, uh, we might try to do that with um, grid cells. And um, if we have uh, grid cells, a population of grid cells, we can still try to estimate where we are as a weighted sum of the firing rates of each grid cell multiplied by its uh, tuning profile, big G multiplied by little g. And again, if we wanted to know where we would be at, in one time step later, we can multiply by the transition matrix. But um, the interesting thing is here, if we could choose the firing profiles to be what are called eigenvectors of the transition matrix, then by definition, what that means is that those are uh, vectors or, or profiles that when you multiply by the transition matrix, they don't change, they just get scaled by a, a number, lambda, shown here. So if we want to predict where we are at time t plus 1, we just have another weighted sum of firing rates and firing profiles weighted with these uh, eigenvectors lambda now in the sum. So uh, we could be reading out from these grid cells either where we are as a weighted sum like we would do with place cells. But if we want to know where we'll be in the future, we can still read that out with a, with a linear weighted sum. We just have to change the weights uh, from each grid cell by a small amount, uh, the, the value lambda for each uh, grid cell. We could even calculate the expected future probability uh, discounted into the future by multiplying by the transition matrix once and twice and three times, each time uh, down-weighted by a value gamma. And this um, sum of all future occupancies discounted into the future is something called the successor representation. And it estimates uh, what's our likelihood of ending up in any other future state at any point in the future. And that could be useful for guiding our navigation. For example, we could navigate by just choosing to increase our chance of ending up in the goal location that we're interested in. Um, just a couple more minutes, please, Neil, if you can. I know yeah. we started late, but uh, thank you. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to. Um, well, first of all, uh, the point that I to reiterate the point that I just made. If um, we use eigenvectors of the transition matrix as our way of representing where we are, it facilitates uh, prediction. And as it happens for transition matrices that uh, look like diffusion or randomly moving equally likely in all directions, then their eigenvectors do look like grid cell uh, firing profiles. And so that's a hint that we might be on the right direction. And the new work that I wanted to uh, indicate, uh, but probably don't have time to at this point, is that um, there's actually a limitation to just imagining diffusion. We actually want to know what's going to happen uh, under movements like moving north, south, east, and west. So these directed transitions, uh, for each direction, we'd have a different transition matrix. And so it'd be hard to choose a representation that worked in a way that could enable us to predict what's going to happen when we move in any direction. However, in work with um, Chang Min Yu and uh, Tim Behrens, uh, a potential solution is that all uh, translation invariant situations. So in all situations where the effect of a movement is going to be the same across all uh, state space, give rise to uh, the same kind of transition matrix. It will be different for each different direction of movement, but they'll all have a particular structure. And that means that they'll all have a common uh, set of eigenvectors. So we could choose a set of uh, Fourier eigenvectors, which will be eigenvectors for all of these different transition matrices. And that would be a really good way to represent where you are, because now you could do prediction under movements in any different direction. Now, that makes for uh, lots of, so here's a, a, a picture of all of these sort of uh, plane waves. And uh, I can see you're indicating that um, I need to wrap up, which I'm going to. So um, what I'm going to skip over is the fact that uh, this thinking both uh, makes 
lots of detailed predictions about grid cell firing and what drives it and enables us to do navigation in situations where there's a uh, translation um, biased in one direction or another. And interestingly relates to uh, theta rhythmicity in the firing of these uh, grid cells. And again, theta rhythmicity is something that's brought by the ascending inputs into the medial temporal lobe from the uh, medial septum. So finally, to um, summarize everything I've done, in this talk uh, rather rapidly and uh, starting a bit late uh, is to take three different aspects of um, the structure imposed on us by thinking about how space is organized. One is that we need to do egocentric allocentric translation and that the uh, output from memory into imagery will require that translation and we can understand how we do that. And this is a process also referred to as scene construction or perhaps even episodic re-experiencing. And I think Faraday will talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's also true that we have to bring together environmental and self-motion inputs. And uh, PAPE circuit is important for that and the grid cells and place cells may well do that. And the exact way that they do that may be organized in a way that the grid cells capture the transition structure or the way that you can move around in space, whereas the play cells are specific to different environments where different um, environmental information is present. And together, that enables you to make predictions, even in new situations, because you've already captured the structure of space in the grid cell representation. So I'd just like to thank uh, all of the people uh, I think I mentioned them during the talk and they're showing the bottom and my funders. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you, Neil. That was an absolutely masterful and uh, very clear summary of some fantastic work um, extending over a long period of time and really relevant to many different um, aspects of space memory and representation. So uh, really enjoyed that. Now, uh, I think it is a tradition that we do have questions at the EPS, and I know we started late and we're under time pressure, but I think I would like to allow time for a few questions. And because it's my first time using this technology, I'm not quite sure where these questions come from. So I was hoping that uh, something would pop up on my screen with uh, thousands of questions from um, uh, people, but I haven't seen that. So I don't know, Neil, whether you've got any feed uh, giving uh, you questions. I don't I, have. I think if we click on that link that Sarah Lynn sent us <laughs> to have the public view of what's happening, then uh, that's probably where the questions are. Well, if you can see that, why don't you pick um, a question from that? I'm I'm not seeing that feed. I've been asked to use a different feed. So Right. Well, um, I've just clicked on it right now, and it seems to be loading. Uh, but I've no idea what it will look like. I don't know if uh, Sarah Lynn... May I ask a question, perhaps? Oh, here we go. Thank you very much. Um, now, here's the group chat coming, so I'm also going to be able to do that. So, uh, um, I, of course, I'm not quite sure how to log into that because I haven't been given a, a, a way to log into it. But while we're waiting, can I ask you a question um, just um, which comes to my mind? So I was very interested in the way that you described the grid cells as... Uh, being a transition structure. And I just wonder whether there's a, um, an alternative way of thinking about grid cells, which is much more perceptual and less computational. So could the grid cells simply be, for example, uh, um, counting the number of steps um, or accumulating the proprioceptive information generated by the animal self-motion? Or could they be um, accumulating the vestibular input, which, which is going to um, obviously change as the animal moves around. So these are kind of more sensory interpretations um, and less computational, less predictive um, interpretations. Uh, yes, so um, it's pretty clear that um, the grid cells are updating their firing patterns driven by proprioception and vestibular inputs uh, and uh, self-motion generated optic flow, for example, um, you know, it's environmental information, but it's about self-motion. Uh, and you can see from the virtual reality that um, actually um, rotational vestibular information is present in that virtual reality, but the linear yeah. acceleration is not. Yeah. And the grid cell firing patterns are, are 
fairly similar to when they're actually moving around. So yes, the, the grid cells are being driven by those uh, movement inputs. And that was one of the things that led the, mo the last bit of research that I wanted to talk about, because uh, the point of view from machine learning of eigenvectors of, of state uh, transition structures uh, doesn't really make any contact with that uh, path integration, integration of, of, of internal action signals. And so to bring the two together, it turns out that um, the way that multiplying by eigenvalues changes the representation is exactly the same as uh, models of grid cell firing that uh, use the theta phase precession, the phase coding of, of uh, location to um, update position driven by these ascending inputs from the, from the um, medial septum, uh, which do convey uh, information on, on self-motion. And so the two uh, viewpoints uh, do come together in that you can see, you can use the same math to capture path integration as you can for capturing prediction. Right, now that's, that's interesting. So in, in a sense, it's a matter of interpretation whether one treats the, the, the data um, as uh, evidence of prediction or evidence of um, sensory accumulation? Well, um, uh, that's true. But then if you do treat it as prediction, you could predict what the effects of actions would be without taking them. But it would be the same right. machinery that, uh, uh, work that enables you to update where you are given actions that you have actually taken. Now, that's, that's uh, very good. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, we've got one further question, uh, which has uh, um, come in, which refers specifically to the case where people are navigating on, on computer screens, for example, in a video game. And the question is, I wondered how translation from egocentric to allocentric uh, was made via game fields when people are navigating through scenes shown on computer screens. Head movements are limited and are relatively common and relatively common between scenes. So this is the difference, I guess, between a virtual reality space experiment um, on a computer yeah. screen and real open field. Well, um, in terms of two-dimensional computer screens, there are experiments in, in, in primates and, and human uh, primates, um, which indicate that you get grid-like representations uh, when you move your eyes on the screen. Yeah. And so um, the, now the eye, the eye proprioception would be taking the place of the bodily proprioception, but updating your representation of, of where you're attending on the screen uh, may follow all of the same uh, machinery. That's really, uh, really useful. So it, there's something generic about the computations and the spatial representation. Well, thank you very much. I've, I've now found the uh, chat and the questions, and there are many people asking on the stream about uh, technical issues about uh, what what they can see and why is it working or why is it not working i do hope you've all been able to connect there um, and uh, just to reassure people these uh, sessions will be recorded and we hope to make the recordings available because i think they'll be very useful for many people neil thank you very much uh, for that excellent start thank you thank you and uh, now we're going to move straight on because we are running rather late to the next um talk and Sarah Lynn Van is going to uh, take over. So I'm hoping, Sarah Lynn, that we should be, be able to see you and uh, your, everybody can see you and your title is the Mamillary Body Anterior Thalamic Axis, a Pathway for Time and Space. So Sarah Lynn, if you could speak for around 20 minutes and excuse me if I then give you a reminder, we'll still have time for some questions. Thank you. Fantastic. And thanks so much for the invite to give a talk today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the mammillary bodies. And the mammillary bodies were actually one of the first brain regions to be implicated in memory. Um, back at, can you hear me? OK. Yes. Yeah. Oops, sorry. I'm making sure I've got yeah. my mute. Yeah, you're, you're blind, but we can hear you fine, thank <laughs> you. Or at least I can. Thank you. Um, so when uh, Van Gooden, at the end of the 19th century, noted that it was mammillary body atrophy in patients with Korsakoff syndrome. And one of the key features of Korsakoff syndrome is quite a profound amnesia. However, the problem with Korsakoff syndrome is that it typically arises as a, as a result of alcoholism. And as a result, there's quite diffuse um, damage to gray and white matter um, regions. So it's quite difficult to describe a, a specific brain region to the memory impairments observed. 
So we get to the point that 108 years after they were first implicated in memory, we get, we've got to, one of the few things that is agreed about them in many bodies is that they might or might not be important for memory, which was a bit of a sad state to be in regarding the memory bodies. Um, so what I'm going to say is that over the last 15 years, I think things have changed quite a lot and we're going to have a lot clearer situation about what the memory bodies are doing and their potential role in memory. And I'm going to try and give you some idea of what they're doing and explain how they might be supporting memory um, over the next 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to start with a study that we carried out uh, on colloid cis patients. So colloid cis are benign cis of the third ventricle. Um, so they in, they in themselves are benign, but they tend to cause hydrocephalus. So typically they're, they're surgically removed. Um, and it's found that um, some patients with uh, colloid cysts tend to have memory impairments. So we targeted a group of patients um, who'd had colloid cysts. Basically, we did a, a national recruitment and asked um, anybody who'd had colloid cysts whether they wanted to take part in our study or not. And from this, we got 74 patients who um, agreed to take part in the study and we carried out standard neuropsychological tests on them and then asked any of those if they wanted to um, have a scan in Liverpool in Marriott. So again, none of this was biased towards whether patients had memory impairments or not. It was just simply whether they wanted to take part in the study and then whether they were happy to go to Marriott. Um, and so just as an example, um, this is a kind of thing at the top. This is what we see with a colloid cyst. So this was actually a patient who had a recurrent cyst after having their original cyst removed. They went and during the scan, we actually realized that in a couple of patients, the cyst had come back again. But what we found um, quite frequently with these patients was quite severe mammillary body atrophy, which you can see down in the bottom left, um, really atrophied mammillary bodies here compared to the control next to it. So what we did was um, we did a volumetric analysis um, measuring a large number of brain regions and correlated this with their performance on memory. And we found that mammillary body volume consistently correlated with um, mammillary, um, memory performance across um, the Weschler memory scale. So a number of um, measures. And again, it was really consistent. And it was the only brain region that came out as being correlated with memory performance. And actually, what we did when we started to look at the types of memory that were affected, it was really recall, recollective memory that was particularly impaired. So in 13 out of the 14 tests of recollective memory, we found this correlation between memory body volume and performance. Um, which is really nice having this correlation there, but actually um, it's quite interesting then seeing what happens if we can compare two groups of patients. So in, within our group of 38 patients who we got scanned, we took the 10 with the largest mammillary body volume um, and the 10 with the smallest mammillary body volume and directly compared them and they were matched for everything. So they'd all had colloid cysts, all had surgery, everything was the same apart from their mammillary body volume size. And we found that there was no difference on their scores of recognition memory but in recollective memory, the um, mammillary body, the ones with the small mammillary body patients were particularly um, impaired. So here we are starting to get information that the mammillary bodies are important for memory and they seem to be particularly important for recollective memory. When we're trying to find out what the mammillary bodies are doing, we can either look directly at the mammillary bodies or we can look at some of their efferents. So the mammillary bodies themselves don't project to any of the other, you know, big memory regions such as the hippocampus or cortex, but they do project to the anterior thalamic nuclei, which then go on to project to hippocampus and cortical areas. So by looking at the projections from the mammillary bodies to the anterior thalamic nuclei, we can really start to try and work out what information or what role the mammillary bodies are having. So by actually lesioning this tract or looking at damage to this tract, it's quite informative in telling us what the mammillary bodies are actually doing. And what um, we find is that in, oh, that figure's not quite right. Um, <laughs> um, what we find is that in patients with thalamic infarcts, that it's typically um, patients that have got damage to the mammillothalamic tract that's really predictive of whether they've got memory impairments or not. And in a study by Carlesimo et al, he had a patient with a mammillothalamic um, infarct, and he found that again on familiarity or recognition tests, they were absolutely fine, but when you're looking at recollective tests, the ability to recall information, they were, um, this patient was particularly impaired. So we're getting a very similar pattern to what we've seen with our colloid cis patients, so um, this sort of dissociation between simple recognition and more recollective or detailed memory. The problem with a lot of the patient studies is they're great, but then the damage is never specific and there's always additional damage, making it very difficult again to, to work out specifically what part is causing the damage. So by using our animal models, 
we're able to really make very discrete circumscribed um, lesions that we can then say exactly what's going on. So this is what we've done with mammillothalamic tract lesions in rats. Um, and so we started off just looking at the, a very simple object recognition task, which matches up quite nicely to some of the tasks that we use in humans. So for this, if anyone's not familiar with this task, um, the animals are put into an arena and they've got four identical objects that they can explore. The idea with this task is that rats like novelty, they like new things, and they'll spend more time exploring something if they seem new and exciting. So on your test session, you swap two of the objects with new objects. And the idea is that if they can remember the previous objects, they'll seem boring to them relatively, and they'll spend longer exploring the new ones. So it's just a way of trying to work out whether they can remember the objects that they've previously been exposed to. And this is exactly what we find um, with sham animals. They discriminate the new objects more. And also with our lesion animals, they also discriminate nicely, showing that they do have a, just a simple um, memory for previously viewed objects. So that kind of matches up with the recognition memory um, that we see in our patient group. So that seems to be upheld and that's not affected by damage to the system. But what we're seeing with the patients is an impairment in a recollective memory, so impairment in a more detailed contextual memory. Um, so is that affected in the animals? And that's what we can use the same sort of task to look at that. So here it's the same sort of setup, except this time we've got four different objects, A, B, C and D. And then in the, um, they have a break and then they have a test session. And in the test session, two of the objects are swapped over. So in the test session, they, all the objects they've previously seen, but two of them are now in new locations. So the idea is that we're trying to see whether they remember where the objects were previously presented. So have they got a memory for the spatial location of the objects? Um, and again, if they can remember where they were originally, then the B and C become particularly interesting because they're in new places. So that's something different that's happened. And that's what we find, the shams nicely discriminate. They clearly remember where the objects were originally and they pick up the fact that they've been moved in this test session. But the lesion animals are completely at chance. So they're exploring all the objects equally showing that they really don't seem to have a memory for where the objects were before. What we can't tell from this, whether it's an impairment in combining the information about the object and the place, or whether they're just very poor at forming spatial representations in their entirety, which we know um, from previous studies, they seem to be, it's a, it's a bit of both, I think. Um, so something else we can look at in terms of sort of episodic memory that we sort of tend to call in humans, we look at place, what, where, and when traditionally it's called as. So we can, we've seen that they're impaired at the where, and we can also look at the when using a similar type of task. So for this, we have again, groups of objects. So we have one set of objects that we present, we call it block one. We have then have a break for 30 minutes, and then we present another group of objects that we call block two. And then in our test session, after another little break, um, we present one object from group one, block one, and one object from block two. And again, on the idea that things that they've seen recently aren't very interesting. Things that are relatively more novel are more interesting. So objects from block one are relatively more novel compared to the ones they've seen more recently. So they should spend longer exploring objects from block one compared to block two. And again, this is what our shams uh, nicely do. So they spend longer looking at the ones that were presented earlier. Um, but our, sh our lesion animals, again, are a chance on this. So they're really quite impaired and they're not able to form a um, a memory of the temporal order that these objects were presented in. And actually that fits really nicely with what we know about Korsakoff syndrome, going back to that, because one of the first, when Korsakoff originally described Korsakoff syndrome patients, um, one of the things that he said, as, as well as them being having a profound memory, memory impairment, was that their temporal memory was particularly impaired. It was like a, quite a standout feature that he noticed. And again, um, there's been a lot of studies with uh, patients with Korsakoff syndrome, and Kaufman's done a lot of work on this, Mike Kaufman, um, and again saying that, that you know, they're on recognition memory, they're fine, but if they have to do a similar task to what we did with the animals, deciding whether um, words were presented first or second, they're really, really bad at that. So again, we're seeing this really quite consistent picture where simple recognition is fine, but anything where you have contextual details about a memory, where things happened, when things happened, that's when things really start to break down with the system. So the next question is why and what are the mammalian bodies doing? So I said, Neil's mentioned this circuit quite a lot already. So the PAPE circuit. So originally the mammalian bodies were considered to be a, a hippocampal relay. Um, just as a quick dissociation. So 
um, Neil was talking a lot about the head direction system with the mammalian bodies. I'm talking about a different system within the mammalian bodies just to complicate matters slightly. Um, so, th so this is the medial system, um, not the head direction system. So this, um, they were traditionally seen to be uh, just a hippocampal relay. So hi hippocampus projects to the mammalian bodies and they pass it on to the anterior thalamic nuclei and then to the singular gyrus, which doesn't seem very exciting role for any structure, but also seems a bit redundant because the hippocampus does actually have direct projections to a lot of these um, other regions. So what would the mammalian bodies be adding to any of that? So a different idea is that mammalian bodies have got um, reciprocal dense connections with a midbrain region called Gooden's segmental nuclei. So it might be that actually it's these um, connections that are particularly important and the mammalian bodies are actually adding something new to the system, not just passing information around. And this is what I tested um, using rats. So I had four groups of rats, one with mammalothalamic tract lesions um, on top right, sorry, top left, and then on the top right, we've got ones where I disconnected the hippocampus projections from the mammalian bodies. And then I looked at the effect of um, lesions of the uh, ventral tegmental nucleus of Gooden to try and work out which of the important projections into the mammalian bodies and which ones are supporting memory. And I test these on radial arm a standard spatial task, but just in case anyone isn't familiar with it, um, you put sugar reward pellets down the arms. The animal has to run up and down the arms to get the reward pellets. Um, if they go down a previously entered arm, then they won't get a reward pellet. So the best thing for the animal to do is to remember which ones they've been down and don't go down any previously entered arms. So we're doing it using it as a test of spatial memory. So they have to try and remember where in space they've been in a session. Um, so that's the task we used. And here we can see that um, the mammalothalamic tract lesions and the Gooden's tegmental nuclear lesions are both impaired relative to the sham groups. Um, the post commissal fawn excision, so that's the disconnection from hippocampus to mammalian body, um, mammalian bodies. They're sort of sitting in the middle. They're not significantly different from either, but um, as I said, they're just kind of sitting in the middle. But what is interesting is that they all do seem to be improving with training. So over training, they're making fewer errors, suggesting that they are learning to how to remember where things are in space. But always, as anyone will tell you, the problem with animals and behavioural tasks is that they never, do, they never do exactly what you think you're doing. You think they're doing, performing a task and they're doing it a completely different way or cheating or doing something. So it's really important to have your controls in place to try and work out what they're doing. So for this, we use a rotation in the radial arm. So we allow the animals to run down four of the arms, shown here by the red arms, and then um, we take them out and we the most exciting part of the talk. <laughs> we, we rotate the maze round and then we put the um, reward pellets back in the same spatial locations. If they're performing the task using spatial cues, then it should make no difference to their performance. If they're using the task using intramaze or odor cues, they'll still go down these the blue arms, and in which case they'll start making many more errors. So we can then start working out which types of cues they're using. And when we do this, what we find is that the mammalothalamic tract lesions and Gooden's tegmental nucleus lesions, they bounce right back up. So any improvement that we've seen in performance is basically they're just forming a, you know, a compensation strategy or cheating strategy. Whereas now the postcommissaurus fornix and sham, they're unaffected by this manipulation, suggesting they are using the spatial cues um, to perform the task. And again, now we actually see a dissociation between the um, disconnecting the hippocampus and um, from the other inputs and outputs. So from this, it really does suggest that this simple PAPE circuit doesn't really represent what the mammalian bodies are doing. They're not just relaying hippocampal information around the circuit, that this additional inputs from the um, Gooden's tegmental nuclei are really providing a new um, additional um, important information that is necessary for um, spatial memory. But then we get to the point of going, well, what are they providing? What additional information is being given by this route? And we're not entirely sure, but we can start sort of trying to make some guesses. So the medial mammillary nuclei and good, good and ventral tegmental nucleus both contain theta-related cells, again, something which um, Neil was talking about um, recently. So one possibility is that their, um, it's their role in theta that is important um, for some of these spatial memory um, impairments. And we looked at this recently with animals with mammalothalamic tract lesions. Um, we carried out recordings in the hippocampus and um, 
and in retrospenial cortex. And we found that um, hippocampal the frequency of hippocampal theta is reduced following hippocampal following these mammillothalamic tract lesions. So again, it said these are distal effects that we are seeing. The, these pathways don't directly innervate the hippocampus, but we are seeing um, downstream effects on on um, theta rhythm and on theta gamma coupling, and um, on the co coherence between um, the hippocampal cortical structures, suggesting that um, these these areas are providing important information because previously it was just thought that the mammalian bodies were just relaying hippocampal theta around the system and weren't actually contributing anything. But here we're seeing that actually they are doing something and are important for hippocampal theta frequency. And again, we're not entirely sure what this means at the moment, but what we're looking at is potentially um, theta has been linked a lot with um, sequences and with timing. And it, this might be one of the reasons why these um, lesions are so impactful on memory of temporal memory and temporal processing it might be through their mechanisms via theta mechanisms in the hippocampus so that's ongoing project at the moment another thing that we find is if we lesion the mammillothalamic tract we see quite a few changes in hippocampal plasticity so we see a reduction in the number of spines on ca1 neurons um, following these lesions and we also find a reduction in clustering so the idea is that um, New, the spines cluster together because that creates a stronger output and that creates a, a, a stronger um, so a stronger output from the cell. If they're just spread evenly along um, the dendrite, they, it's not so um, effective. And what we find is that with our following our mammillothalamic tract lesions, we have a reduction in this type of clustering. Um, and we also find we have a reduction in, in neurogenesis. So we have fewer adult newborn cells in the dentate gyrus. And the cells that are present, they're far less complex, so far fewer dend um, dendritic spines on them as well. So it's, again, a num it, both of these have been linked to spatial memory, plasticity, learning and memory. And also um, the neurogenesis has been linked quite a lot to re reducing interference. And again, that's something that we see a lot with these types of lesions, um, increased interference. So again, these might be mechanisms by which they're having um, a role in memory. Something else we looked at recently was um, we looked at animals performing an MR, a uh, Regilames task, and then we carried out an MR imaging study of them. So this was in the animal scanner. So we trained animals on a similar task, a working memory task. We scanned them before um, training, and then we scanned them in the initial stages when they were learning the task. And we see this massive increase in um, hippocampal diffusivity. And then in later stages, when they become quite proficient at the task, we see that the retrospenial cortex um, diffusivity changes. So you see this nice kind of hippocampal cortical um, complementary pattern of, act of changes where initial early learning is supported by hippocampus and later consolidated learning is supported by the cortex. So what happens with this with our lesions? We find that um, the mammillothalamic lesions disrupts this plasticity changes in both hippocampus um, and retrospenial cortex. So down the bottom in these graphs, you can see the black lines of the lesion animals. So you see that this, these changes are completely knocked out by our mammillothalamic tract lesions. Um, we also looked at changes in the mammillothalamic tract and unsurprisingly, considering we lesioned it in the black group down there, um, we see huge changes in the mammillothalamic tract diffusivity, which was quite reassuring. Um, but in the mammillary bodies, again, we see changes there, even though they weren't directly damaged. But we also see that in normal animals, we get this, again, similar to the hippocampus, this initial increase um, in diffusivity in the initial coding in the mammillary bodies and the mammillothalamic tract. So again, this might be ways in which the um, mammillary bodies are supporting memory by having these distal changes. Yeah. Um, and just the last bit here is um, a study we carried out in mice, again, looking at the radial arm maze. And, the, and so we trained rats on a reference memory where they had to remember which arms to go down. And then we imaged the, um, we had cranial windows and we imaged the retrospenial cortex using FOSS imaging. And we looked at um, patterns of cell activity across training days. And we found that as animals were getting better at learning which arms to go down, we were finding these repeat patterns of cells being expressed and the more the, the greater the fidelity between the patterns of cells the better the performance and then we did a retrieval task about two weeks later and we found that the better they were at retrieval correlated very much with the amount of overlap with the patterns of cells so they're 
a bit hand wavy engram cells, but they seem to be representations of spatial um, memory within the retrospenial cortex. And what we find again with myelodynamic tract lesions is we get a massive reduction in FOS activity in the retrospenial cortex following these lesions. So again, this might be another route by which the myelodynamic tract and mammalian bodies are having an effect by disrupting these types of um, spatial representations in the retrospenial cortex. And just finally, so I've told you why um, the mammalian bodies, what they're doing and that they're important for memory. And, you know, I think it's really important that we start to look more at structures like these because we're, what we're finding is that a number of brain regions and neurological conditions that have been traditionally linked with um, hippocampal damage, we're really finding medial diencephalic damage with them now. So Down syndrome, again, is a condition linked, you know, associated with memory impairments that has been traditionally linked to hippocampal changes. We see a striking reduction in um, anterior thalamic volume and loss of anterior thalamic neurons, much greater than what we see in adjacent thalamic nuclei. So again, this structure seems to be linked to another condition that's, you know, got memory impairment. And the mammalian bodies seem to be particularly sensitive to low oxygen levels. And what we found recently is that there's a high incidence of abnormal mammillary body signal in neonates with um, hypoxic damage. And again, this has been missed previously because of the size and um, location of the mammillary bodies. But again, there seem to be a number of conditions that have traditionally been linked with hippocampus that actually it could be that the mammillary bodies and their projections by the anterior thalamic nuclei are involved and could be um, kind of contributing to the memory impairments observed. And I just want to say a huge thank you to all my wonderful collaborators and Wellcome Trust for their money. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much, Helen. That was a fantastic talk and um, lots of very interesting material and particularly nice uh, to have a, a really good uh, combination of animal and human work uh, and clinical work as well. So I found that very much a talk in, in the tradition of the EPS. Now, we've got a couple of uh, interesting questions uh, coming through on the Rumble Talk chat. And um, I'd like to start, first of all, with uh, Bob Logie, who's um, asked a question. I think it refers to the study on plasticity. He says, the four rodent groups seem to show similar rates of learning across trials, regardless of the overall difference in performance. Any thoughts as to why? No, I mean, I guess some of it is just standardly they are learning, you know, the practical aspects of the you know performance of just what what is re required of the task so some of it's going to reflect that um but i i guess you know it doesn't tell you how they are learning it and it might be that actually they're all using sort of similar odor cues to start with and then um maybe the others are being you know being able to learn that actually using spatial cues is a more effective way of doing it or that they are using both and that actually you know, that the normal animals are using odor cues, but if you take them away, they are fine at using um, spatial cues. So it's possible. Good, thanks very much. Uh, we've got time for just a couple more questions. And here's a, a really interesting question from uh, Debbie Talmy. Thanks, Debbie. Is the critical function recollective memory or associative memory? Animal well, data can't quite discriminate between these two because the animals always had to associate an object and something else like time or space. But was there any evidence in human data for impaired associative recognition? Yeah, and it really is, I mean, we're still going backwards and forwards about this. So Andrew Mays obviously was very much of the, it is associative memory. And it, it's anything that seems to be combining things. But as I said, yeah. what is it, the bits that have been combined that's the issue? And I think a lot of this with the animals can be resolved more with the electrophysiological studies or when we're getting away from um, tasks that require explicit rewarding, for example. Um, we see we do see impairment, for example, in just simple place discrimination. So it's not just when they're having to combine an object and place. So I think there is an issue with space anyway, but is space itself associative mm. anyway? So it's it's. Those are kind of deep questions. I mean, maybe space appears so strong because it's always there and therefore there are lots of associations with it. Now, we've got sort of um, one minute uh, for the final question. So a question from Paul Duchenko about the bow tie maze. Could the impairment on the bow tie maze be an impairment in discriminating directions as opposed to locations? Um, I think... I mean, I'm not sure because we do tend to switch the, it's all counterbalanced as to mm. which ends are being used mm. um, for anything. 
but I'm not, there's nothing to say that it's not a general um, impairment in knowing their place and knowing how they are fitting in within that. So I would never say it wasn't. <laughs> Okay, well, that's, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, all of those who've asked questions. Thank you, Sarah Lynn, for a really interesting talk, uh, which was uh, v very much um, uh, v v excellent, re really informative. And uh, we've more or less, because of our technical itches, we've more or less missed our uh, coffee break. But what I would like to do is just to take a, a two or three minute pause, just two or three minutes, please, everybody, uh, while um, so that people have a chance to get a drink or whatever, and uh, we'll be able to set up um, the next speaker, Faraday Vargo Cardam, who I hope is waiting in the wings. So uh, thanks very much, Sarah Lynn, and see you all in a couple of minutes. I'm going to leave my uh, camera on and see you in a bit. Thanks.